My theme this evening is the Indian tradition of public debate. I am acutely aware that each of the words in my title raises large hermeneutic and philosophical questions. D in the title, for example, implies a single tradition, or at least one that is dominant and definitive. The word Indian points to a, a tradition with a pan-Indian scope and risks ignoring smaller, what is sometimes called little, regional and religious traditions. The term tradition itself can be problematic because it connotes continue, at least three things, continuity, inner coherence of some kind, and a measure of prescriptive authority. I say all this because I know the problems, and if, if this was that kind of occasion, uh, I could turn each of the words in my title into a lecture by itself. But that's not my purpose. My purpose is very simple. And that is to uh, discuss one particular aspect of our intellectual history. In the long intellectual history of India, people have deeply disagreed on matters of great importance. And they have tried to resolve them by means of debate and discussion. These debates and discussions go back to the Vedic, especially the Upanishadic period, and display a certain pattern and structure. This pattern and structure give, it, give the debating tradition its identity or its specificity. This tradition, which was initially concerned with religious and metaphysical questions for nearly a thousand years of its history, underwent important changes in response to new challenges. The main challenge came in the 19th century, and I'll talk about it, when it was confronted with social issues, debates between conservatives and reformers. It faced even bigger challenges in the 20th century, when it was confront confronted with political issues which it had never faced before. So what I want to do in this lecture is briefly to discuss these changes, and I want to end by asking why the great debates that once marked our history are conspicuous by their rarity, not entire absence, but by their rarity, and why what passes as debates today, certainly in the media and even in parliament, are forms of entertainment rather than instruction or enlightenment. And I say this because, uh, just on a lighter note before we uh, dig deeper into the subject. I remember once asking a good friend of mine, Lord Putnam, who is my colleague in the House of Lords, a great film director who won nine Oscars at Hollywood for Chariots of Fire uh, and uh, The Killing Fields of Vietnam, great lover of India who adopted a leper girl from here, raised her, and I remember asking why Bollywood had not traveled culturally outside India, and why it hasn't had the same kind of impact, universal impact, that let's say Hollywood had. And he said, the very wise man that he is, he said in one word, which has haunted me ever since. He said, in the West, cinema was a form of art, and it always came under the rubric of art. In India, cinema came as a form of entertainment, and it has never grown out of the ethics and logic of that subsumption. And I think my feeling is that the same thing is happening to intellectual debates. They are increasingly becoming forms of entertainment, uh, good fun, good fight, good punch up, rather than forms of instruction. It might be worth asking. No is blaming anybody. Maybe worth asking, and I want to end by asking, is this the case, or is it me reading things wrongly? And if that is the case, how would one explain it? And does our tradition have anything to say about this problem? So let's begin at the beginning. The origins of our tradition of public debate can be traced to the Vedic times. The absence of an officially endorsed and enforced religious and philosophical orthodoxy encouraged a remarkable freedom of thought and expression a near absolute freedom, as Max Weber called it, which the West could achieve only in the late 19th century, according to Max Weber. A wide variety of views emerged and disputes between them developed on such subjects initially 
and the interpretation of the Vedic hymns, sacrificial rites, rituals, and image worship. Later, post Upanishadic and uh, Upanishadic period itself, the questions discussed were widened to encompass large philosophical and metaphysical questions, such as the nature of the Brahman, the Atman, the relation between the two, the meaning of life and death, whether the universe could conceivably be created, as, the, as uh, some thought, or was it eternal, as the Jainas and others argued, or whether the whole question was meaningless, as the Buddhists tended to argue. The dominant Brahmanic tradition was challenged by the atheists, the Buddhists, the Jainas, the Lokayata, and others. As many as 10 different schools of philosophical thought prevailed in the fifth century before the Common Era. Their followers went about uh, conducting their debates in uh, halls which were specifically built for the purpose. And that tells you something about the public significance of philosophical debate and how the shriftis or the rich people would endow halls for debates only. And sometimes even stayed in the same place. There was a hostel, a hall of residence, where the scholars belonging to different schools would stay, debate in the hall, fight with each other, and then uh, return to their uh, hall, uh, to their dining area. There were also internal debates within each school of thought. Of course, we know very well about the Buddhist school. Uh, Buddhist, four different uh, councils where the main doctrines of Buddhism were sorted out. But the same sort of thing also happened in lots of other schools. Public disputes and debates were not limited to religion and philosophy. They extended to other areas as well, such as medicine. In fact, uh, Professor Bhattacharya argued that the debate in India first began in medicine. And from there, it spread to philosophy and other areas. Others think that no, it began in the field of law. But anyway, our concern is not historical. The concern is there were debates, great debates taking place in medicine, law, politics, grammar, and even literature. Charak Samhita <coughs> gives interesting examples of doctors debating the causes of different diseases and their diagnosis of individual patients under the impartial chairmanship of a scholar called Atri, who was concerned not only with the substance of their views, but also with how they arrived at them, how they defended them, and whether their methodology, methodology of investigation and defense was correct. Their, uh, the debates among the writers on Dharma Shastras and Artha Shastras centered not so much on the overall design of the moral and social order as on how to reason, the kind of thing that Dhirubhai was saying, how to reason about the subject, what method of investigation was appropriate to which area, and how to structure and present their works. These debates did not remain confined to their respective areas. The methods and styles of reasoning and even the vocabulary developed in one area influenced those in others and led to much cross-fertilization. Over time, the debate stimulated a meta-debate about the nature of the debate itself and the principles of valid reasoning giving rise to the discipline called Vada Vidya or Vada Shastra. It analyzed the objectives and forms of debate, what counted as good arguments or bad arguments, how the debate should be conducted, where and when the debate was deemed to be settled. Although different schools of thought, especially the Buddhist and the Jainas, answered these questions differently, they influenced each other and developed considerable agreement on uh, the rules and methods of public debate. Charak Samhita, Nyaya Sutra, Asanga's Bodhisattva Bhumi, and others are good examples of this. One of the most important texts is Kathavattu, a Pali text, uh, and that has to be relied upon because the earlier Sanskrit texts uh, no longer seem to have survived. Different schools even developed Vad manuals inst instructing their followers into how to argue in a debate, what fallacies to avoid, how to spot fallacies, and how to expose them. 
Although different schools differed in the way they distinguished, classified, and characterized debates, they were broadly agreed that all debates were of two types. I'm going to cut short much discussion here because I want to get to one or two important points. All debates were classified into two. One was called Tattva Nirni Nishu, which means concern to determine the truth, and the others were called Vijig Ishu, this concern to win. I want to say a little about the first Tattva Nirni Nishu debate concerned with the truth. Brahadaranika uh, Upanishad as the Brahadaranika Upanishad puts it, those engaged in this debate, or more properly called discussion, are sahabrahmacharin, or fellow seekers. Although there is no consistency of linguistic usage between different schools, this kind of debate was sometimes called vada. As Vachaspati says in the uh, Tatparyatika, the aim of vada, and I quote, is to attain the right understanding of a subject unquote, by means of an open-minded dialogue between those who are motivated by the desire to know the truth, what is called tattva bobutsansara, those who are bobutsu, those who are desirous of knowing the truth. In fact, it says tattva bobutsana saha katha. That is the true katha or that is the true dialogue. Truth, it was argued, can only be discovered by looking at a subject from different points of view and assessing the arguments for and against them. In other words, only through a rigorous debate, which is why the famous remark, vade vade jayate tattva bodhava. It is only through vada that you will ever get to tattva bodhava, the essence of whatever it is you wish to know. In the Gita, Krishna calls vada the highest form of discussion, vada pravatamaham. In the Buddhist Pitaka and Jain Agamas, those engaged in, in Vada put forward their opposite views in an honest search for truth and accept in a spirit of humility the truth of the opponent's position when they are convinced of it. Faults in others' arguments were noted and pointed out, but not dwelt upon or used to discredit them. Vada, therefore, is best translated as discussion or deliberation rather than debate or discussion, a debate uh, or disputation. Point here is why is Vada, why is discussion the best way to get to truth? Now, different uh, traditions, uh, Western, will give different answers. In the Indian tradition, the usual answer seems to be in terms of the following three arguments. First, no one's intellect is perfect and his reasoning can be mistaken. Therefore, he needs others to correct him. Secondly, every man is attached to his views, is partial to his views. His ego is tied up with his views and hence others are needed to liberate him from his attachment, from his ego and correct his biases. And the third reason why Vada is crucial for the discovery of truth is that even if you are right, confirmation by others adds to your self-confidence and gives you the certainty that you are right to hold the view you do. Hence, cooperative inquiry, or what is called Sandhaya Sambhasa, or Anuloma Sambhasa, is considered absolutely essential for any intellectual inquiry. In such an inquiry, and this is where the uh, rub comes in, in such an inquiry, it is crucial that one should be free of raga and dvesha, attachment, anger, and hatred, or the desire to score points. In other words, in the Indian tradition, intellectual open-mindedness alone is not enough. It should be accompanied by a certain kind of moral character, what you might, what you might call a pure heart, or at least an unclouded and undistorted mind which is capable of receiving the truth. Ethics has always been tied up with epistemology in the Indian tradition, and this is one example of this. Let me turn very briefly now to the debate which we had concerned to score victory, to win. Now, in contrast to the uh, truth-determining debate, which normally occurs among the members of a school of thought, 
The Vijay Gishu debate, those concerned to win, was conducted with one's opponent. And obviously, one's aim was to win. Ideally, it must be conducted by fair means. But under circumstances, you can see the Hindu casuistry, there are many casuistry here, but under circumstances, unfair means are completely allowed, not even allowed, mandatory. And unfair means include linguistic tricks, uh, dubious intellectual maneuvers, fast thinking that trips your opponent, and believe it or not, paying a bribe or corruption. <laughs> and in our shastras, there is a strong sanction for using uh, bribery uh, in certain situations. Now, when uh, are unfair means allowed, and it's very striking, they are allowed when your opponent is not seriously interested in discussion, but keeps raising stupid objections just for the sake of it. Or he is a heretic. Or he is spreading subversive doctrines. And there is a wonderful sentence which says, sometimes you have to have a thorny hedge in order to protect the rose against the predators. You can even go further. And the bother can take the form of the thunder, which, which simply means to smash, to hit on the head, to destroy. And hitting the thunder was justified when re, their opponent was really threatening loka sangraha or the stability of the social order. But by and large, these are only in exceptional situations. Uh, the debate should be conducted by fair means. And when debates were conducted in this way, and this is the extraordinary part of it, when debates were conducted uh, in this way, they were always in public, presided over by a panel of learned people in the area, and always involving the general public, in those days which would have meant the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas and maybe some sections of Vaishyas. But they were public debates, and there are reports that on some occasion there were 10, 15, 20,000 people attending a public debate of this kind, of a philosophical nature. And I shudder to think what they would have made of the debate about whether the universe is eternal or created, sitting there. But people did clap, ask searching questions, evidently. The point that Raji was making, the job of the intellectual, here the job of the pundit, was to raise the level of awareness such that that level in turn makes strong demands of the intellectuals and raises the intellectuals too. Now, in these debates, uh, there is a vadin, somebody who makes a challenge, who advances a position. And if you are, if you win, you get the title of a vadin. And the more ambitious vadin would travel from one part of the country to another, defeating all the vadins in the area in order to get the title of vadi chakring or Vadavatal, the uh, like Dig Vijaya, the supreme Vadin, and this is what happened to Shankara and Ramanuja or Vallava and Madhava and others. You become a true Acharya by going around the country, which many of them did, defeating Vadins and acquiring this kind of title. Beautiful stories, which I'm not going to narrate about. What, why did they do this kind of thing? What were the forms of punishment? And the debates were taken so seriously that you don't uh, engage in it lightly. And debate had a penalty. If you lose, you have three choices. You uh, submit to the winner and become his follower, or you leave the area, or you commit suicide. And there are examples of all three in our, countless examples of all three uh, in our history. Now, Rewards are equally great. If you win, you collect money, you get tuition, private tuition, because people would now come to you. You also get a royal status, and of course, uh, you get the royal patronage and uh, uh, rewards. The debates, philosophically, have two or three important features, which I want to highlight, because again, they show how this debate has a certain character. First of all, there were absolutely clear rules about what counted as a weak or a fallacious argument. In Nyaya Sutra, which is a classical text in this way, list 22, uh, what are sometimes called nigrahasthana. So an argument is going on, and if the opponent thinks that this man is too fast with his argument, or too quick with his conclusion, you will say, check, and you point out what the mistake is, nigrahasthana, the man is defeated. If 
it applies adequately, you move to the next one. There are 22 types of sensors or nigrahasthana or defeat situations identified by the Naya school. And they include such things as, to give you examples, modifying your position subtly while pretending to be saying the same thing, or shifting, or implicitly denying the original thesis, or giving untenable reasons for changing it, or using the same word in two different senses, once in one sense when it suited you, and then and in another sense when it didn't, or being evasive, or more importantly, which is common amongst us social scientists, using misleading similes and analogies. <laughs> and when the opponent was declared defeated, uh, he was declared defeated when he was rendered incoherent or reduced to contradiction. The important thing is, this is all fascinating, but the important thing is the following point. When the leader was religious uh, in uh, character or the founder of a new system of ethics, particularly ethics, higher standards were expected of him. It wasn't enough that he should win an argument. It was necessary that he should win over his opponent. And the two are not the same. I can bludgeon your intellect into submission, but you might say, well, maybe I couldn't produce good arguments today, I'll produce them tomorrow. Or maybe I was not bright enough, or maybe this guy is smarter than me. No genuine inner conversion being won over by his argument, so not just convincing someone, but persuading him. So that he voluntarily says, you're absolutely right, you know, I was wrong, I'm your follower from now. And in this uh, context, the Buddha's case, I think is particularly interesting. He tended to find this Brahmanic debate and disputation that I talked about rather tiresome, combative, violent, even aggressive. He called halt to those kinds of debates amongst his followers. Since Buddha was not coming out to debate in a way that the Brahmanic uh, rules of debate required, Nigrodha, a Parivrajaka, remarked, a beautiful remark, he said, Buddha doesn't converse enough. And this next sentence is even more beautiful. His wisdom is damaged by solitude. He doesn't converse enough. His wisdom is the Sanskrit. It is even beautifully. His wisdom is damaged by solitude. And he says, if the Buddha were to debate in public with some of us, me thinks we would roll him over like an empty pot. Well, the Buddha was aware of all this. He knew how he was attacked, who was attacking him, and why. And he says in a beautiful set of ten sentences what could be said about him and how he would respond to that. And let me just read them to you. This is Buddha saying this is what people would say about me. Buddha does this, means, uh, he, uh, although he issues a challenge, he does this in empty places and not in assemblies. And the Buddha defends himself in empty places, not in assemblies of scholars like this. Two, no, well, he does issue the challenge in assemblies, but he does it without conviction and confidence. Three, no, he does challenge with confidence, but people don't ask him questions, so he gets away with murder. They do find him worth hearing, but having heard him, they surrender in intellect, but are not convinced within themselves. No, they are convinced within themselves, but they show no sign of belief or no sign of conversion. No, they do give sign of their con conversion, but they do not follow his path. They say, yes, we agree, but stay at home, don't join him. Or finally, they follow his path, but they don't succeed and find Buddha a fraud. Now you can see how debate is understood here in an extremely sensitive way that it means not just intellect, arguing and overwhelming somebody's intellect, it means winning somebody over and raises all kinds of questions which I don't have to explore, which is winning somebody over would mean what? What in you must I appeal to? What kind of argument must I make or in addition to an argument, what else must I say 
in order to get you to agree with me. So that's broadly uh, how many of these debates took place. Technically, I think the important thing is when different schools debated or defended their positions, they had to appeal to independent sources of knowledge called pramanas. What is the source of knowledge to which you are appealing? How do you validate your knowledge claim? Now, different schools recognized and prioritized different pramanas. Charvaka stressed perception. Buddhism said perception as well as pratyaksha, uh, sorry, pratyaksha as well as anumana, inference. Sankhya, both these plus shabda or verbal testimony. Some Nyaya schools said upamana or analogy. Some others said it could be your uh, experience, anubhava. Different schools had different standards for validating knowledge claims. Question was when you when the disputants belong to different schools, what pramanas did they appeal to? Because no pramana was acceptable to both, and it is there. And this is the debate that we have in, in amongst philosophers, political philosophers today. If you belong to different traditions, what are the standards to which you can appeal? Because standards of one tradition alone uh, are not binding on the other. In our own tradition, there were three different strategies employed. One was to appeal to those standards which no one could question, like internal consistency, the principle of non-contradiction, coherence, and so on. And the idea was to show that the other, the, the other person's thesis could not be consistently maintained. Second strategy was to uh, the two disputants to agree, saying, look, for the purpose of this argument, for the purpose of our debate called Samaya Bandha, for the purpose of debate, this is the pramana, let's start. Or the third would be, one accepted the pramanas of the opponent school for the purpose of the debate and aimed to show that even by his own pramana, uh, he could not consistently maintain his position. Now, in order to ensure, and this is another part of the uh, important distinguishing feature of our tradition, in order to ensure that the debates were fair and productive, the disputants were expected to be fully familiar not only with their own school of thought, but also with the opponent's school of thought. Sometimes in the debates, it was required that they should begin with a brief statement of their opponent's position, which the opponent found acceptable. Many followers of each school would therefore make it a point to master the doctrines, not only of their own school, but also of the opponent's school, and went and studied in their institutions. So lots of Brahmanic scholars going to Buddhist schools or Jaina schools in order to learn. When that sort of thing happened, obviously, there was a good deal of conscious or unconscious borrowing and blurring of boundaries. Shankara is a classic example of this. Here is a man who uh, uh, questions about the Dharma, questions Buddha's doctrine, and ends up absorbing a good deal of Buddhism, so much so that he was called Prachanda Buddha, and Vallabhacharya even calls him Anta Pravishta Chor. <laughs> you know, and a thief who has entered into our house. <laughs> uh, Shankara is really a Buddhist who has got into the Brahmanic tradition. So with this kind of borrowing, the result was that the boundaries between different schools were never rigid. You didn't even have to say that they were porous, because although at one level you would say, I am a Buddhist, you are a Jaina, or I am a Vallabhacharya, or you are something else. Although you identified yourself in terms of a certain school, you were you had learned a great deal about this and absorbed a good deal of the other within your own tradition. So rather than looking for a common ground to all, the commonality was infused into each in this kind of way. And I say this because philosophically the important point is this is imminent or induced universalism through this kind of conscious and unconscious borrowing rather than some external framework. One of the consequences of this debating tradition was that almost all philosophical works uh, in uh, India were written in the form of debates. Either there are actual debates or debates are or the opponent is anticipated and answered without being named. 
And this is true not only of big philosophical terms, but also of sutras and karikas. It is also quite common for textbooks on philosophy to include chapters on each of the major schools, present them sympathetically at one point, and then later on point out, their, uh, point out what they take to be the limitations of this. Which is why I think Professor Bimal Mathilal is absolutely right when he said that debate is the preferred form of rationality in India. The rationality for us is not individual reasoning, it is rationality as teased out of a debate in this way. Now this tradition of classical debate, uh, which I have only briefly sketched, had four distinguishing features which also, in my view, constituted its limitations in the long run. First, it was largely confined to philosophical issues and avoided social and political issues. The Acharyas were supposed to talk about big philosophies about Atman and Brahman and so on, but no Acharya, to my knowledge, has spelt out the social and polit political, forget political, even social implications of their position. With the result that many of them almost felt defensive about the caste, either remained completely uh, indifferent to the caste system, Varnavyavastha in those days, uh, or even aim, ended up being defensive. Secondly, ethics, was, as I said earlier, was bound up with epistemology. So in order to be able to get to the truth, you must be free of raga, dvesha, and all that, which is fine, which makes a lot of sense. And ethics and epistemology have always been connected. I mean, as Ashish has often argued, lots of other people, a good scientist must at least be honest. He mustn't cheat. He mustn't produce bogus findings. So some kind of morality is presupposed in, in epistemological inquiry. Except that in our case, it's not just the ordinary professional morality or the academic morality, it is the personal morality also important, which is fine. You should be free of attachment to your ideas. But then, you, there is constant temptation to take the next step. That those who are completely free of uh, raga and dvesha are somehow epistemologically supremely privileged. And they can be what is sometimes called sarvagnya, or they have got brahmagnana, and therefore they cannot be faulted. That kind of authoritarian epistemology can easily arise out of the relation between ethics and epistemology. Thirdly, I think if the view of reason that is taken in our tradition, and there is a strong rationalist uh, tradition, or some, not rational, strong rational tradition uh, in Indian philosophy, but very often the view of reason taken is rather truncated. It is argued that to depend on reason alone is, is shushk tarka, it's dry intellect, it's just tarka, it's not buddhi, it's not pragna, it's tarka, it's logical inferences which is fine. And the argument then is that because reason by itself can lead to shushk, tarka, it must be grounded in something. And grounded in what? Grounded in those truths which are intuitively grasped. And these are called mahavakyas, like tattva masi. I mean, the whole Shankara is a reflection on tattva masi, or aham brahmasmi, or brahma satya jagan mithya that you take these Mahavakyas as true, as absolute premises, and reason within the terms of those Mahavakyas. With the result that a, a tendency develops not to question the absolute premises upon which your uh, philosophical tradition is supposed to rest. And that leads to a certain degree of not only uncritical acceptance of this absolute premises, but also a tendency on the part of philosophers to define themselves not as individuals, but in terms of this school or that. Nagarjuna, the Buddhist. Dev Suri, the Jaina. Shankara, the Vedantin. There is always the something, the school to which the person belongs. And growing out of this, the fourth feature is that because there is this tremendous concern on logical characteristics of a system, coherence, consistency, non-contradiction, and, and so on, the appeal to actual historical or social experience or practice tends to be rather minimal. So that even someone like Kautilya, forget the abstract metaphysics, but even someone like Kautilya when he writes Arthashastra, there is no reference 
to actually existing constitutions. There is no comparative study of regimes. There were several regimes which must have existed. The kind of thing, let's say, the Aristotle does. I'm not saying Aristotle is better. I'm simply saying that here is Aristotle's inquiry when he writes his politics, takes about 70 different kinds of constitutions, thinks about them, compares them, controls them. You don't find that kind of inquiry uh, in Coffelia. Well, anyway, this is broadly the tradition, uh, and these are its strengths, and these are its limitations. This tradition travels on, very active, very creative, until at least the 14th century. And these some beautiful works produced until the 14th century within the tradition, manuals of debate. Then it has a different kind of history. It meets challenge at the hands of Islam. Now, one would have thought that just as the Brahmanic challenge uh, at the hands of Buddhism produced an enormous amount of intellectual effervescence and debate, the arrival of Islam would have produced a similar kind of debate. It didn't, for all kinds of reasons, one of which is that Islam was not identified as Islam. When Muslims came, they were identified in ethno-cultural terms, Turkeys or whatever, not as Muslims. With the result that there was no theology to engage with because that was not the mode of identification. There was also the question that lots of uh, Hindus, if that is not an anachronistic expression for that period, were victims of caste system, untouchability, and so on, in danger of conversion and uh, to Islam, force, but mainly voluntary. The Brahmins' main preoccupation was to make sure that that doesn't take place. And that's where you find the Puranas and the entire Puranic literature promising them heaven on earth if only they would stay within the fold. So as a result of all that, the formal dialogue, the formal debate that could have taken place doesn't take place, but a lot of informal dialogue, informal debate, if that is the word you want to use, takes place between the two major communities. Bhakti movement is a wonderful example of all this, and there is a folk debate semi-literate, semi-articulate debate going on. But the big debate of the kind that we saw between Brahmins and Buddhists or Brahmins and Jains or Buddhists and Jains, that kind of debate is not there. And the, and the informal debate that takes place, where Kabir and Surdas and Chaitanya and all these people are involved, what one sees is the emphasis on commonalities. Don't quarrel, we share so much in common. The earlier debate was not we share so much in common, the earlier debate was this is where we differ, and I'm going to show you that you are wrong. The big debate, in my view, comes in the 19th century, when the missionaries appear. And they pose two kinds of challenges. One, the Hindus feel attacked because their religious beliefs, practices are questioned. And also, as the, under the impact of modernity, as well as other reasons, there is great churning within the Hindu society itself, and there is a demand for reform. So you have two debates going on at the same time. Debate between the Christians, not all of them missionaries, Christians, Jesuit, from Jesuits downward, Hindu pundits and Christian missionaries, and the debate between conservatives and reformers within uh, the Hindu society itself. And in both cases, often, the leading participants were the same. And it's very striking how when somebody's a, a Brahminic scholar, <coughs> a pundit, arguing with a missionary would take one position, but arguing with the conservatives in his own community would take a slightly different position, because the audiences were different, the concerns were different. One example for, uh, 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 of the kind of debate that took place between uh, pundits and the missionaries was in 1824 in Banaras, and the debate went on for about two weeks when the missionaries asked the Hindu pundits, do you believe in one God or many? You know the story. One God or many, and the pundits say the question is absurd and blasphemous. Why is it absurd? Well, please tell me, is air one or many? Is energy one or many? The question doesn't make sense. Why? Because energy is not a being, it's impersonal. So when you ask me whether God is one or many, you are assuming that he's a person. What entitles you to make that assumption? He could be impersonal, Shakti. Question is absurd. Next question, where is your Bible? What do you mean? A text in which God reveals himself. Oh, God reveals in many texts. What is your problem? Oh, one definitive text. 
Oh, for God's sake, same mistake again. Why one definitive text? God reveals himself differently in different yugas. And God reveals himself, leaving you free to choose the text that is appropriate to your swabhava. Not only yuga, your personal swabhava. Right, next question. And it goes on like this. For their part, the Hindu pundits ask missionaries questions. Trinitarianism puzzles them. They take the thing of God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Ghost in the shape of Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh. And they say, look, your trinity doesn't quite log seem logically right. I mean, God the destroyer, God the creator can make sense. But this the Father, the Son, and the Ghost? Or when you talk about Christ dying on the cross, either your God has no power to stop it, in which case he's not God, or he doesn't love, because how can he allow his own son to die in such an excruciating death? Or vicarious at all. The debate goes on, and the volumes and volumes of those debates are absolutely fascinating. And similar kind of debate takes place between the uh, and the uh, missionaries in Sri Lanka. And I looked at two of these volumes, and with thousands of people, ordinary folks, joining in, just as in this Banaras debate between the pundits and the missionaries, which I think sometimes the Hindu pundits were doing Vitanda rather than Vada, but that's permitted in, in our tradition, you see. So that's one kind of debate taking place where the old tradition is drawn upon. There is the other debate between the reformers and the conservatives, which turns out to be more tricky. And that leads, again, I mean, it's familiar to all of you, and several of you have written about it. This involves Shastra Arthur. That there is an established practice, whether it is sati or bizodi marriage or, or, or whatever. Should this practice not be changed? No, it shouldn't. Why? Because it has shastric authority. How do you question this if it is legitimized in terms of a shastra? So the debate turns on shastras at various levels. No, the shastra doesn't say this. Or which shastra? Not the, maybe the shastra that you choose. But the other Shastra doesn't say this, like uh, Raman, uh, uh, Ram Mohan Roy's debate on uh, widow remar on uh, Sati, or Ishra Chandra Vidya Sagar on widow remarriage. They would say, look, uh, Manu might say this, but Parashara Smriti doesn't say this. And in this particular context, for this yuga, that Smriti is more relevant. Or when you say Shastra mustn't be Veda Viroda, but what does it mean should not go against the Veda? Does it mean that uh, if, if something is not in the Veda, does that by itself make it Veda Viruddha? So the debate goes on in terms of Shastras, but there the tradition runs into a difficulty. Because if you point to one Shastra, the other chap can prefer, refer to another. What do you do? And ultimately what happens is that there is no escape beyond uh, escape you have moved you beyond the Shastras to certain general principles. This is immoral, this is improper. But those general principles become problematic because what is the validity, epistemological validity of those principles? And if you look at the debate, what you find is while there is some always reference to Shastras, they are always read in the context of, or the appeal to Shastra is entangled with either appeal to reason, this is not rational, Ram Mohan Roy talks about it, or certain universal principles, or this is not in the interest of our society. Stop, allow widow remarriage, because otherwise lots of widows are ending up in Banaras as prostitutes, our race is suffering. Is this what we want for our people? So these kinds of considerations come in, and the tradition has to take account of this. But the important thing is that this debate so on social and religious issues, mainly social issues, still is within the tradition. It has the same character as public. Ram Mohan Roy doing this before hundreds of people, or sometimes in a large bungalow with about 30, 40 people. Dan and Saraswati, 58,000 people in the Kavasi Hall, in, uh, or whatever hall it was in, in uh, Mumbai. Thousands of people being publicly involved, learned judges, a platform like this with 10 pundits sitting, presided over by some by a great um, man, local worthy, and lots of shastras and each quoting one or the other. 
And when the child is about to lose abuse, becomes the tender, and there is also a good deal of violence. So the tradition continues, taking these kinds of forms. The trouble comes, even bigger trouble comes, that the third phase of this major debate in the 19th and the early 20th century, which throws the problems of a political kind. For example, uh, the kind of country India is, or should be, the basis of its nationhood, the place of minorities, what is India's place in the world, what kind of a state should we have, how should the state be designed, what is the relation between state and society, state and nation, between society and nation, place, all kinds of political issues of this kind begin to appear under the colonial rule as we get closer to independence. And it throws up kinds of debates which India, to the best of my knowledge, had never had before. Because there was no occasion. Our philosophical debates were largely philosophical, metaphysical, or religious in a loose sense of the word. Then the debates, 19th century, were about social reform. Political debates, when they begin to take place, were something new to us. And since Mahatma Gandhi was leading the national movement, he was the center of most of these debates, especially six, which were absolutely crucial in shaping the political profile of India. The debate between Gandhi and Nehru, about modernity and modernization and so on, between Gandhi and Ambedkar, not just about the Dalits. Gandhi Ambedkar debate went much, much deeper about the nature of representation, the nature of Hinduism, the nature of caste, the nature of India, and very important concept which doesn't figure in Gandhi's thought but figures very prominently in Ambedkar's thought is the concept of fraternity. Where Ambedkar said, I just don't want equality. Don't want the same rights as you because I can have the same rights as you and still you may not want me as your neighbor. You may never shake hands with me. You may never touch me. I don't want just equality. I want you to recognize me as one of you. Do I belong to your society or I don't? Concern for belonging introducing the idea of fraternity, which is why it is hardly surprising that in the preamble to the Constitution, the word fraternity is introduced by him because it mattered a great deal to him. So Nehru Ambedkar debate, uh, sorry, Gandhi Ambedkar, Gandhi Jinnah, Gandhi Tagore, Gandhi and Orthodox Brahmins, and Gandhi and the Hindu nationalist. This, these debates all veer around the Mahatma because he was leading the movement and was presenting a comprehensive alternative and each of the components of the package that of his alternative was questioned. Now, how do, when these debates appear, how do you handle them? How do you resolve these debates? You can't do Shastra Arsha. Certainly, you couldn't do that with Muhammad Ali Jinnah or anybody else. You can't have philosophical debates, saying your, uh, Gandhi couldn't have said to Tagore, you are guilty of the, violating the principle of non-contradiction or incoherence. How do you resolve these debates? And I think it's very striking that if you see those debates, there is always this puzzle about, we have started the debate, but how do we handle it? How do we resolve this debate? And, and ultimately, I think we have no choice but to draw very heavily on the Western tradition, because that is where these debates had been occurring for the last uh, so many years. And here, the classical tradition uh, doesn't have very much to say, except one, and that becomes very important. And that is the idea of truth determining debate. That the concern of Vada is to determine truth, and therefore bringing different points of view and organizing a dialogue, a deliberation between them, such that we might be able to get to the right understanding of the subject called some Vada. And I think this is what happens in the constituent assembly debate, and the result is the Constitution of India. Well, Rajiv, I take five more minutes and I stop. Uh, so I have roughly said, sketched the history uh, very tentatively of our tradition of public debate. These great debates that we saw right until our independence, for some reason begin to get rather thinner, lack bite, uh, and continue but in a rather muted form after independence and eventually seem to peter out. How does, if this is a correct diagnosis, 
And there are people here whose judgment I trust far more than my own. If I may be wrong, but if I'm correct in thinking that the kinds of great debates that we saw, Hindu Buddhism, Brahmanism, Buddhism, reform debates, or uh, political debates surrounding the Mahatma and others, if great debates of this kind have more or less become uh, muted or not very active, how do we explain this? And I have a tentative hypothesis, and that is of, uh, of the following kind. That Nehru had always argued, and certainly after independence, that every country must have what he called a national philosophy or a national ideology to give it a sense of purpose, a sense of direction. And Nehru's national philosophy, which he also called the absolute premise, the absolute premise of independent India. And for Nehru, the national philosophy consisted in the package of six, seven different elements like secularism, you know, scientific temper and all that. And he made sure, with all the great authority that he had, that this national philosophy became the absolute premise of our way of thinking. It was not challenged. The only serious challenge was to this element or that element within the package, but no comprehensive alternative to it. The Hindutva walas, the Hindutva ideologues, perhaps might be seen as providing some kind of alternative to it. They challenged it. But A, they challenged only one element in that package, namely secularism, not others. And you couldn't do that at the intellectual level because all these elements are closely bound up. And you couldn't take one in isolation and challenge it because what's your position on the others? It also meant that even when you came to secularism, they didn't question it fully, and all they would say was, yours is not genuine secularism, ours is. In other words, we accept your category, we only disagree about what it means. And in the absence of a critical engagement, either with modernity or with the Hindu tradition, it's very difficult to work out an alternative form of secularism. With the result, that the Bharatiya Janta Party, which is of which one would have expected a well worked out, not the party, but the Hindu ideologues, Hindu ideologues, well worked out alternatives, remained a hodgepodge of ideas drawn from different sources, adding up to very little, accepting certain forms of political venom from time to time. In the 1990s, the Nehruvian national philosophy comes under criticism uh, and is replaced by a new orthodoxy in the form of economic liberalization. But again, it becomes a new orthodoxy. And what strikes me in post-independence India is how we move from one orthodoxy to another. And with this orthodoxy, this economic liberalization was not preceded by a profound debate resulting in the national consensus. And nor has it been criticized, except in bits and pieces here or there, but there is no well worked out alternative to it in terms of which one can criticize it. Now, how do we explain, if what I have said is correct, how do we explain this relative decline uh, in the quality of debate in our public life? And I would say very briefly that debates don't spring up from anywhere. I mean, there is a debating culture, there is a debating uh, climate. Debate presupposes three things. First, some conception of the whole. I'm not just talking about myself, I'm part of a whole, and I have a view of the whole in terms of which I'm going to take a certain position. It implies that ideas are the basis of my action, not just interests, not just my identity, but ideas are the basis of my action. Three, availability of a range of well-considered alternatives, so that one can choose and say, here I stand, and this is my enemy, or this is my opponent. And fourthly, the I, the Ideas are generated by intellectuals, using the term loosely. And it's very important that there should be a constant flow of ideas between, a constant interaction between intellectuals on the one hand and politicians and ordinary citizens on the other. And if there is a disconnect, as Dhirubhai and Ashish have talked about, then it becomes very difficult to produce a body of ideas. You can produce them abstractly in your big philosophical terms, but they don't become part of public discourse because they don't take roots. And my feeling is these four conditions, not all of them, or at least some of them have obtained in independent uh, in India. 
as a result of which uh, debates have not come up in a big way. Well, to conclude, uh, I have uh, sketched the origins and development of our tradition. With all these limitations, I think the tradition has stood us in good stead in several respects. Thanks to the tradition of public debate, we accept differences and disagreements as a normal part of life. We are not disoriented or intimidated by them, which is why the Sanskrit sentence repeated in many languages, munde, munde, matir binna. Every head has its own different mati, not just different intellect. Secondly, we not only accept differences as part of life, we see them as desirable. Which is why vade vade jayate tatvabodha. It is only through debate that we will be able to get to the truth. We also recognize that differences can be resolved by argument. And when they cannot be resolved, uh, we can see why people hold those views and we respect them. There's a lovely sentence in Mahabharata which says, Shukshma vivado vipranam shule kshatro jayajayo. That the kshatriyas you know, fight out everything in terms of weaponry. The Brahmins, the truly sensitive, intelligent people, settle their differences by subtle debate. Sukshma vivado. And I think we recognize that dif differences can be resolved by sukshma vivado. Since our tradition emphasizes these great virtues, that intellectual boundaries are, over, are porous, it encourages also the fusion of ideas and sensibilities and avoids unnecessary polarization. This I take to be the positive legacy of our long tradition of intellectual debate. And that tradition, that legacy has created a deep culture that is conducive to our dialogical democracy. Not a populist democracy, but a dialogical democracy, which is based on debate and rational discussion. If that culture were to weaken, that culture which sustains dialogical democracy, if that culture were to weaken, it would have a profound effect, not only on the quality of our democracy, which might become non-deliberative non populism, I mean, which is what happens now. If that culture were to uh, weaken, we will, it will have profound impact, not only on the quality of our democracy, but also perhaps on its very stability. Well, thank you very much indeed. And once again, I want to end by wishing happy birthday uh, to CSDS and wishing another 50 years uh, of excellent uh, contribution to our country. Thank you.